Good evening or good morning, everyone. My name is Daniela Osatsky Stern, and I would like to welcome all of you again to the virtual space of the Western Galilee College, the Holocaust Studies Program. Uh, we have become, um, we made this event a tradition this last year, an international discussion of Holocaust scholars. Yesterday, we marked the International Women's Day. And today, we are gathering to talk about new trends in women and gender issues during the Holocaust. No doubt this topic is important and unfortunately has been under-researched for many years. I can give you just one of many examples from my own research on Jewish partisans, during which I encountered dozens of testimonies of female partisans who spoke frankly about their experiences as women in the forest. Many of them had been left out of the mainstream historiography. We all follow new works and initiatives in, the, in this field. And tonight we are lucky to have with us just several of the leading scholars who are kind enough to share with us some of their ideas and findings. Some technical notes. We are recording this session and will upload it to our website. And please keep your microphones on mute. As always, I want to thank Dr. Boaz Cohen, Dr. Ronnie Mikkel Ariely, Jan Bujlaf, and Dr. Yaron Pasher from the organizing team. Roni, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, it's, it's like always a pleasure to see so many familiar and uh, as well as uh, unfamiliar faces with us today. I can see people from South Africa, from India, from the US, from Canada, from all over Europe. Uh, so welcome. Uh, I actually remember, like, I think it was two months ago when we started thinking about this event. And it's, uh, I think it's, it's very exciting to have all of you here with us. And I would like, uh, without uh, further ado, to, uh, to present our uh, keynote speaker, our opening uh, uh, lecture, Professor Marian Kaplan. Uh, is a professor of modern Jewish history at NYU. She's a three-time National Jewish Book Award winner for the making of the Jewish middle, middle class, women, family, and identity in Imperial Germany, between dignity and despair, Jewish life in Nazi Germany, and gender and Jewish history, uh, uh, as well as a finalist, a finalist for uh, Dominican Heaven, the Jewish Refugees uh, re Refugee Settlement in uh, Sosua. Her other monographs include the uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish Feminist Movement in Germany, Jewish Daily Life in Germany, uh, 1618 to 1945. She has also edited several books on uh, German Jewish and women's uh, history and has taught courses on uh, German Jewish history, European women, women's history, German and European history, as well as European Jewish history and Jewish women history. Uh, today, Professor Kaplan will, uh, will give her opening lecture titled Gendering Holocaust Studies Looking back and forward. Professor Kaplan, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. And happy belated International Women's Day to everybody. Um, OK, I will start with my, with my talk. And I will time myself. OK. Um, looking back on the 
past three decades of historical studies on Jewish women and the Holocaust is no small task. I started my own research in the 1970s with a study of the German Jewish feminist movement and with another book that analyzed women's roles in Jewish families in late 19th century Germany. By the early 1990s, the field of women in the Holocaust had just begun. My own interests stemming from my family history, my parents had been refugees from Nazi Germany, and from my earlier engagement with the women's movement as a graduate student at Columbia, led me to the field. It took a while for me to gain the courage to address Jewish women and families in Nazi Germany. It felt too close. Still, as with my other scholarship, I wondered, might women have experienced this era differently than men? And if so, how? The early pioneers of this field assumed yes, but we needed to do the research. I will start there, but first a historical reminder. 1980s feminists may have propagated this agenda, but questions about gender arose long before, before we knew it. Dr. Emanuel Ringelblum's collection of testimonies, reports, and surveys in the Warsaw Ghetto, later known as the Onyx Shabbat Project, asked questions of and about women, and many of the collectors were women. Polish Jewish historian Philip Friedman, who survived Lvov in hiding, set an agenda for future research as early as 1945, including the biological impact of starvation, statistics of biological destruction, the disintegration of the family, on and on. The first large scale research impetus came in 1983. And that's the first PowerPoint that you're seeing. I had the privilege to participate in a path-breaking conference coordinated by Joan Ringelheim and Esther Katz in New York City, entitled Women Surviving the Holocaust. For two days, 400 survivors and female scholars, as well as two male scholars, tried to figure out whether, and if so, how gender mattered. At points, we broke into small groups and I had the opportunity of taking notes in one survivor's group. I recall my surprise and confusion when many survivors both rejected the salience of gender and highlighted it. In other words, these older women claimed being a woman did not matter and then described how indeed it mattered. I thought then and still think that many survivors did not want to support a feminist inquiry and yet hoped to tell their stories for posterity. That same year, if you look at PowerPoint three and then four, that same year, these, this is the conference. Vera Alaska, herself a survivor, published her Women in the Resistance and Holocaust, 1983, using women's published testimonies. And if you look at number five, the woman smiling is Ilza Blumenthal Weiss who survived Theresienstadt with her daughter but lost her husband and son um, in the Holocaust. 12 years after that first foray, Dahlia Ofer and Leonora Weitzman organized the International Workshop on Women in the Holocaust at the Hebrew University in 1995. Why did it take so long? The short answer, scholars needed to do the research that connected women's history, feminist theory, and the Holocaust. This took time. In the 1990s, for example, Lessons and Legacies of the Holocaust, published by the Holocaust Educational Foundation, offered just two articles about women in the first volumes spanning the 1990s. That's Claudia Kuhns in volume one and Judy Baumel in volume two. Scholars focus on Jewish women caused some opposition in the 1990s, part of a conservative backlash against feminism. One critic accused women's and female gender studies scholars of enacting a quote, macabre sisterhood with the dead Jewish women of Europe and others faulted feminists for using the Holocaust for their quote, own agendas. Specifically, these critics saw gender analysis as privileging women, that is raising women's suffering above that of men. 
and they maintained that women's experiences were irrelevant or even irreverent. Thankfully, this debate died down pretty quickly. Indeed, women's historians had always underlined that being Jewish mattered first and foremost. But as Joan Ringelheim wrote, quote, the end, namely annihilation or death, does not describe or explain the process. Mary Felstener specified that along the stations toward extinction, quote, each gender lived its own journey. I added rather defensively, probably appropriately for 1998, quote, to raise the issue of gender can never place blame on other survivors for the disproportionate deaths of Jewish women. Blame rests with the murderers. To raise the issue of gender also does not place it above racism. We know that the Nazis did not want to, quote, share the earth with the Jewish people. However, gender helps to tell a fuller, more intimate, and more nuanced story. It gives Jewish women a voice long denied them and a perspective long denied us. And I believe that to this day. Research on Jewish women did not occur in a void. American and European women's historians began publishing on a wide variety of topics linked to women's history. For example, becoming visible, women in European history. Historians in the mid 1970s all be also began to explore women in Nazi society, especially German non-Jewish women. And number six is Claudia Kunz's Mothers in the Fatherland slide. In the 1980s, Claudia Kuhns, as well as Renata Breidenthal, Atina Grossman, and I, in a book called When Biology Became Destiny, that's number seven, continued to research German women, but also included Jewish women in these histories, but separately. These books coincided with and were greatly influenced by the scholarship of women's history, as well as its, as its entry and women's entry into the academy. And I underline women's entry. I don't think it would have happened otherwise. How did scholars write these histories? First, we needed to discover materials in newspapers, government archives, organizational archives. Many also turned to memoirs, diaries, letters, and interviews as crucial first person evidence. Reapplying the feminist motto, the personal is political, many historians insisted that the personal was also historical that without women's memories, we missed half the history of the Holocaust. More specifically, without women's memories, we missed the familial and domestic aspects of the Holocaust, but also the gendered public behaviors and humiliations, as well as gendered persecutions in ghettos and camps. Indeed, Beverly Chalmers, who you'll hear later, concluded that diaries and memoirs dating from the war and post-war years are the two major sources regarding pregnancy, birth, and sexuality. In addition, comparing personal testimonies of both Jewish women and men makes gender an obvious, really an inescapable lens. The conference I mentioned in 1995, and that's PowerPoint number eight, a point, opened new research avenues, including the history of Jewish women and families before the war in both Western and Eastern Europe, women's struggles in ghettos, camps, and the resistance, and women's accounts in Holocaust literature. Most of these topics focused on women rather than on comparative gender analyses, but some did that as well. These themes set the stage for the next 20 years of studies. Researchers, myself included, benefited from the topics raised at this event. The sources suggested the creative energy bursting from the conference itself. Ofer and Weitzman's Women and the Holocaust came out three years later. That's PowerPoint nine. As did Judith Tidor Baumel's Gender and the Holocaust. This brings me to the topic I delivered at that conference out of which grew my book Between Dignity and Despair, Jewish Life in Nazi Germany, and that's PowerPoint 10. Please bear with me as I use my own work to highlight a few major gender differences that emerged. 
Although the calamity that hit German Jews affected them as Jews first, they also suffered based on gender. At first, Jewish women were far more vulnerable, sorry, Jewish men were far more vulnerable to physical assault and arrest. And women remained to carry the burden of maintaining homes and families. Even if ultimately Jewish women were also enemies doomed to perish in the Nazis race war. Not only was early Nazi racism and persecution gendered, so too were the victims' survival strategies in practical and psychological terms. The victims reacted not only as Jews, but as men and women. A focus on women led me to recognize, for example, that in contrast to men, most women took the early warning signals far more seriously, adjusting to the abrupt changes in law and culture imposed by the Nazi party and embraced by non-Jewish Germans. Women eagerly trained for jobs and crafts useful abroad, whereas men hoped they would be able to maintain their businesses, careers, or professions. And at home, women made do on smaller budgets, shopped in hostile stores, and tried to create cheer in cramped spaces, while husbands were asked only to limit their expectations. Finally, many women became breadwinners, often for the very first time as husbands lost their businesses or jobs. Gender made an enormous difference in deciding between fight and flight. In the <laughs> early years, Jewish women were more sensitive to discrimination, more eager to leave Germany, more willing to face uncertainty and lower class status abroad rather than discrimination and ostracism at home. Jewish men thought they had and had a great deal more to lose by fleeing. Over 80% of Germany's approximately 525,000 Jews lived solid middle-class lives. These men had to tear themselves away from their life work, whether a business or professional practice, usually more educated than women. Many men felt a deep attachment to German culture and additionally, many had fought in World War I and believed their service would count for something. Most importantly, since middle-class men had previously been the primary breadwinners, as long as they made a living, they were unwilling to face poverty abroad. In light of men's primary identity with their occupation, they often felt trapped into staying. Women, whose identity was more family oriented struggled to preserve what was central to them by fleeing with it. Still until November, 1938, some of those men who had not lost their jobs and businesses remained either hoping the regime would collapse or trying to get the documents necessary to flee. In addition, different experiences in the world of work um, men and women also led different lives and often interpreted daily events differently. Women were more integrated into the communities. They noticed daily interactions with neighbors, with the grocer, and with diminishing participation in women's groups. Raised to be sensitive to social situations, their social antenna were finely tuned and also directed toward more unconventional, what men might have considered more trivial, sources of information, what the baker said, whether the neighbor gave her usual hello. Men mediated their experiences through newspapers and broadcasts, whereas women's narrower picture, the minutia and significance of direct everyday contact brought politics home. Women also seem to have been acutely aware of children's unhappiness, another reason to flee. When children suffered from abuse at school, mothers and fathers often disagreed as to the solution. Tony Lessler, the founder and director of a Montessori school in Berlin, forcibly turned into a Jewish school, remembered, quote, the city schools became ever more difficult for the Jewish children. And it may have been false pride that caused the fathers in particular to give their children, to keep their children in city schools. Lessler pointed not only to fathers' aspirations to give their children a quality education, but also to their stand tough approach. Memoirs furthermore attest to fathers' unrealistic hopes that the children would not suffer 
and to their insistence that they develop, quote, thicker skin. Recalling debates within Berlin Jewish families, Peter Wyden summed up, quote, it was not a bit unusual in these go or no go family dilemmas for the women to display more energy and enterprise than the men. Almost no women had a business, a law office, or a medical practice to lose. They were less status conscious, less money oriented. They seemed to be less rigid, less cautious, more confident of their ability to flourish on new turf. Finally, I noticed that women's perspectives highlighted entirely new public and private dimensions of history. For example, men wrote of the public spectacle of the November pogrom of 1938, smashed shops, burning synagogues, the lasting impression of broken glass in the streets. Most of what we've learned about the November pogrom comes from precisely these public images. A powerful image mentioned often and only in Jewish women's memoirs is that of flying feathers covering private internal spaces, the home, hallway, and courtyard. It took until 2019 for a new book on Kristallnacht. Um, you can turn to the next PowerPoint number 11, edited by, Wolf, edited by Wolf Gruner and Stephen Ross, to offer more research on interior spaces and to put a photo of SA men destroying a living room on the front cover of their new book. Similar to pogroms in Russia at the center of the, at the turn of the century, the marauders destroyed furniture, tore up goose feather blankets and pillows, shaking them into the rooms, out the windows and down the stairs. Bereft of their bedding, Jews lost the kind of physical and psychological security and comfort that this represented. In addition, they could no longer replace those items due to the cost and the looming war economy. Broken glass in public and strewn feather beds in private spelled the end of Jewish family life and security in Germany. Gender differences in perceiving danger accompany gender role reversals in what Raoul Hilberg described as communities of men without power and women without support we find for the most part anxious but active women who early on greatly expanded their traditional roles. One example will have to suffice. It focuses on the November pogrom. Okay, I'll start again. It focuses on the November pogrom highlighting women's activities under dire circumstances. While destroying Jewish property, the marauders also beat and arrested about 30,000 men, interning them in concentration camps. There were exceptions. Some women were publicly humiliated, beaten, and murdered, but most women were forced to stand by and watch. Later, women su summoned the courage to overcome gender stereotypes of passivity in order to find any means to free men from camps. Ruth Abraham, and that's PowerPoint 12, impressed her family, but also the Nazis with her, her determination. During the pogrom, she pulled her fiance out of his store and led him through the teeming crowds. Then she traveled to Dachau to ask for the release of her future father-in-law. Arriving in a bus filled with Hitler's elite troop, the SS, she entered the camp where they ignored her. She assumed that because of her quote, Aryan looks, her light hair and blue eyes. Those in charge took her for a member of the League of German Girls. She requested an interview with the commandant and begged for the release of her father-in-law. She succeeded again, attributing her success to her looks, since the men who helped her refused to believe she was a full, quote, full Jew and seemed to take pity on her. Abraham's highly unconventional behavior found a more conventional reward. The couple married immediately. The rabbi who performed the ceremony did so with bandaged hands, an indication of the treatment he had received in a concentration camp. Even though women transcended certain gender roles, gender as such caused serious consequences in emigration. Gender made a difference in matters of life and death. For example, more women were than men were trapped in Nazi Germany. There are many explanations for that, and somebody can ask me later, but I wanna move on because I see time is running out. 
These were some of the early takeaways with regard to gender at the grassroots. I found that the genders often perceived and reacted to the same events differently. And gender could also be a matter of life and death. What happened in the next 20 years? To this day, there seems to be a good deal of social history and women's history, including local histories of Eastern and Western Europe and histories of camps and ghettos. Often these social and women's histories include women, but are not consciously about gender. If we approach topics in a gendered way, might it change our narratives? Holocaust historians, especially male historians, rarely ask how women experienced aspects of the Holocaust differently from men or this, how this might change our understandings. Literary scholars do this more often. They ask gendered questions of their texts, whether autobiographies or fictions. They come to the text with a particular interest in gender and women, but fewer historians seem to go beyond including women, and I would add including a few women. Still, some promising research has appeared lately. I can't go into all of it, I'll mem mem mention a few. I'll start with histories of Eastern Europe that Natalia Alexion kindly shared with me. For example, there is new work on Jewish women inside and outside of the Krakow ghetto, which includes family life and women's strategies of survival on the Aryan side. Women hiding in bunkers, social roles in ghettos, more testimonies and literary perspectives, and work on individual women like Rachel Auerbach of the Warsaw Ghetto based on her diary and literary work. In addition, autobiographies have flourished. In 2009, Louise Vasvari gathered 400 entries of women's life writing from Central and Eastern Europe. And these are only the ones in English. That was the result of a boom in such writings that occurred after years of mostly remaining unpublished. Research on sexualities and the body have made significant progress in the last year, mostly in last years, mostly as women's history. Back in 1993, Claudia Schuppmann addressed how the Nazis targeted lesbians, and we can find lesbians and the Holocaust noted in studies in the Shoah in 1999. But we need far more research and taboos make this difficult. Still books about same sex desire exist. And if you turn to number 14, I've used MA and Jaguar in teaching and hope to translate parts of a relatively new book in the series, Jewish Miniatures, that focuses on another couple, Marta Halusa and Margaret Liu. A bibliography of lesbian and trans women by Anna Haikova lists close to 150 titles. Also queer history itself, as well as how that research can answer questions about women's lives should be addressed though these topics get harder to research as time passes, since the numbers were much smaller than the general survivor population to begin with. Endangered as Jews, women also experience sexual vulnerability. Sexual violation often started with sexual humiliation, nudity, shaving. Anthropologists have pointed out that we need to understand violence not solely as a physical, but as an attack on the humanity, the personhood of individuals. In camps, for example, many daughters had never seen their mothers undressed and then in front of male guards, nor had most women ever shaved their heads. One survivor wrote of the blow to her morale, quote, we could have been shot guests and yet this single act of German brutality constituted a sacrilegious act on our bodies, our only possessions. This may have affected religious women even more. Men too were shaved, but in general spoke far less about sexual violation or worried about nudity. The sexual economy and sexual barter need further exploration as well. Recent work on Theresienstadt, for example, highlights the power dynamics of unequal relationships, but is also stymied by taboos. Many survivors, male and female, saw women's sexual victimization as a stigma to be concealed. If you go to PowerPoint 15, you will see a, a snapshot of the film, Long is the Road, shot on location in a Jewish DP camp in Germany in 1947. It offers a powerful example. The young woman in the film wants to confide to her male partner 
about something that happened to her during the war. But the man gently hushes her and tells her it's better to forget. Viewers understand that he hopes she will stop dwelling on her trauma, assumed to be rape or sexual barter, but also that he does not want to know. If or when there was a sexual barter, how do we understand this as a choice or a choiceless choice? Perhaps the memoir, and this is PowerPoint 16, of Marie Jalowitz Simon published in 2015, so just recently, can offer some clues. Born to a middle-class Jewish family, she was only 20, young, slight, and pretty when she decided to go underground in 1942. Luckily, some non-Jews helped her throughout her subterfuge as a half-Jew in Berlin, but her sexual relations with men made a decisive difference in her survival. A Bulgarian painter actually fell in love with her and offered to take her to Bulgaria. She agreed, hoping to make her way to Palestine from there, but those plans fell through. Still, she spent safe weeks with this man, whom she also considered her lover, although she realized they would never share a future if she survived. She had several other relationships as well, and her last one, two years long, involved a Dutch worker who had come to Germany on his own before the Dutch forced laborers. He was a strong anti-Nazi. An intermediary told this inexperienced young man that Marie would be his sexual liberation and that she would keep house for him. She saw him as a safe haven. They lived as a couple, although he occasionally hit her angry at her love of reading. He could also be quote, pleasant and considerate. And they had a lot to talk about with regard to the war. How do we, how do you analyze the story? I asked before, are these choices or choiceless choices? How do historians, even victims, distinguish between, between forced and consensual relationships? When these could mean the difference between life and death? I do not have an answer. The interesting and arresting part of Simon's story is that she understood her situation bartering sex for safety, and still sometimes even liked the men she was with. In no sense did she see herself as purely a victim of the men, even when she let one of them, quote, have his way. She took a dim view of her circumstances with men, but survival remained foremost. She makes it very clear that she was a victim, not of these men, but of the Nazis. If I have a few more minutes, I would go into the newest research. What do you think, Roni? Sure. Okay. Go for it. All right, newest research. So rape now has uh, now an object of scholarly inquiry, took many years for scholars to address, not only because of taboos. Sarah Cushman wrote of the difficulty of representing sexuality without crossing the line to pornography. Yet she also reminded us of Elizabeth Heinemann's assertion that, quote, failure to investigate evidence that appears time and time again is in an academic sense, bad scholarship. In a moral sense, it disregards the imperative both to commemorate past victims and to prevent future atrocities. Sources were and are available. I think you'll hear of some this afternoon or this evening, but they're complicated and scattered. Older testimonies do exist. Still, we need an ensemble of data from victims, witnesses, and perpetrators. To confound matters further, much of this testimony is partial and some of it's unclear. Nazi documents, army cases, post-war trials of perpetrators have their own issues, although they need to be used with care. Scholars like Regina Mulhauser, Zoe Waxman, and Beverly Chalmers, among others, have raised these topics and offered many examples. I would argue that their work should not only be seen as specialized histories of rape during war, but as Holocaust scholarship. Further, substantiating this notion, David Cesarani, in his 1000 page book, The Final Solution, showed that almost every atrocity against Jews in Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, and Ukraine included rape and sexualized violence against Jewish women, sometimes by Germans, 
sometimes by their local helpers. Who were the main perpetrators of rapes against Jewish victims? Research highlights the Einsatzgruppen and the Wehrmacht as perpetrators, particularly after the beginning of the War of Annihilation against the Soviet Union. Some of this information comes from later testimonies of German soldiers since rapists often killed the victims. Other German soldiers proved reluctant to talk about these events even after the war, either to avoid being seen as brutal or for fear of admitting to what the Nazis had termed Rassenschande, racial shame. Yet new research makes absolutely clear we can no longer accept this racial shame as an excuse, since it did not, as a rule, inhibit sexual contact. Inside Germany, courts treated this transgression harshly, but most soldiers got away with it at the Eastern Front. In other words, rape may not have been part of the Nazis' original genocidal plans, but it became, as Mulhauser says, a normal part of everyday warfare. Looking ahead, I would like to raise some areas that need further attention, both older and newer historical fields. And now I'm going to list them because we're running out of time. Aryan women, whom I've not discussed, but who many see as second tier agents of terror, to quote Doris Bergen, need further investigation despite the good work recently done in that field. In addition, Aryan women made up a majority of the Rosenstrasse crowds, those people who tried to bring their Jewish husbands back from the camps in Berlin in 1943. Um, I would also like to see more actual gender research, real contrast between women and men and integrated history. And I for one have not done that, but I would love to see it. Uh, this would include masculinity studies as well as how class or ethnicity was expressed through gender roles. There have been there's been very important research recently on women's bonding experience and camp sisters. And we need more of that and more comparison with males. We've seen young girls adopted by female strangers or by girls from their hometowns. We know Ruth Kluger's mother adopted a daughter in Auschwitz. The three survived together and remained a family once in the US. How widespread was this? Do we see similar relationships among men besides Primo Levi, who does have a close relationship? I also see family histories as opportunity to highlight gendered reactions uh, when faced with persecution. And the history of mothering during the Holocaust needs more attention. One camp survivor repeated as a mantra, quote, I had a mother, I had a mother underlining how her mother made the difference between her life and death. How did mothers manage to do this, to flee, to clean, to nurture children, not just as survivors, but also as refugees? For example, Leah Lazigo with two children and a three month old infant climbed the Pyrenees on foot in 1943. She arrived in Lisbon in time to have the children sent to the US. So here the issue is not just that gender roles prove malleable, but that women often performed roles expected of men and sometimes vice versa. I think I'll leave it here. I've gone five minutes over and I left out the history of emotions, which I think is a new wave that needs looking at. And I will thank you now for your attention. Thank you so much. Professor Kaplan, it was fa a fascinating uh, talk. And I think I'll, I'll take uh, the opportunity to, to be the first to ask a question. And I will invite all of you and the audience to, to pose your questions uh, through the chat. Uh, but I, as you know, I'm, I'm uh, working on uh, a project on the deportation to Mauritius. And you mentioned gender and uh, Jewish immigration. And of course, your uh, most uh, recent book on uh, Hitler's uh, Jewish refugees, hope and anxiety in Portugal. Uh, and I was wondering uh, uh, if you can elaborate on this aspect as well. Uh, on the aspect of gender, of gender and, and refugees. 
Yes. Okay, so that's a whole other talk, but briefly, um, what I noticed when I did my work on life in Nazi Germany was that gender is very clearly um, um, made upside down. In other words, that the gender roles reversed in many cases. And I you know, gave you a few examples now, but there are many, many cases. What I noticed among refugees Aside from the fact that women uh, often on their own because their men were in hiding or their men were in camps, did cross the Pyrenees, did try to you know, uh, escape with their children, but mostly I see gender flattening among refugees. They're both unemployed. She was maybe never employed, but you know, worked in the home, um, but they're both unemployed. Their statuses have both shrunk dramatically, disastrously. They don't have money, they have nothing, they're just partners. And so they argue and they discuss and they try to figure out, now we're in Paris, the Germans are coming, what do we do? We get on our bikes or we, you know, we, we walk with our feet or we try to get on a crowded train. They seem to be much more um, And that happens in Lisbon too. She stands on one consulate line. He stands on another consulate line. They share the work in a way that I don't think happened um, earlier or that was, as I said, upside down during the Nazi period in Germany. So there's a lot of, uh, of that. Nobody can work. Refugees are not allowed to work in Portugal. Um, that's against the rules. So they sit in cafes. They write letters to their families back home. They receive letters um, from Eastern Europe, from Theresienstadt, from the Warsaw Ghetto, from Berlin, et cetera. So I, my sense is it, it flattened a lot. Um, however, social workers noticed that when um, the Portuguese got tired of all these refugees in Lisbon, they um, deported them to small, fishing villages in the north, north of Lisbon, not in the north, but north of Lisbon, um, where they were kind of imprisoned. It was called a fixed residence. They were not allowed to leave the fishing villages, but they could walk around the villages. The women tended to somehow make themselves busy, whether in the household, whether taking in laundry from other refugees, knitting, having knitting circles, sending packages of food to Central Europe or Eastern Europe, and the men tended to be depressed. And that is not so striking because there's a wonderful sociological study of unemployed men during the depression in Austria. And I'm forgetting the name, but Claudia, if you're still there, help me out. It's a beautiful, essay. Anyway, point being, the men were always depressed and the women were trying to stay active. The men sort of pushed away even from taking care of the children. Um, so to some extent, there is a gendered reaction. But um, And also the other thing is, even in these refugee homes in Portugal, if they manage six or seven people to be in a home, um, some people described that the men and women shared the work in the house, which I found interesting as well. Um, the women washed the dishes, I remember, and then I had to take out a snarky sentence after that in my book, which is, no one tells us who dried the dishes. <laughs> so I assume it was the women as well. But I think there was inequality there. There was a way in which the men and women tried to work together in the, in the home. Many men and women went to um, soup kitchens. They didn't cook at all. You know, they were in they were impoverished. They didn't have a hot plate in their rooms. So many of them. So again, that equalizes the group. So I think, to some extent, I'll be interesting interested to see what happens in Mauritius, because if you have more freedom, if the men can go out, that's one thing. And if the if they're stuck in a DP camp or in a camp then um, I don't know. Yes, it's I mean, interesting. Hand, gender always happens. And on the other hand, it can get broader or narrower, I think. Definitely. As you spoke, I, I thought that 
that it's really interesting to think that in Mauritius, most of the, the, the suicide cases were, I think uh, only men committed suicides. So they were all very productive, but still, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. But we have one more question. Jan, do you want to pose it? Absolutely. Thank you very much for this insightful lecture. Uh, good to see everybody. Um, and you already teased a little bit about emotions and the role, the, the ties and links between emotions and gender. And I know we, both of us, we talked a little bit about, you know, various concepts that we can, you know, pull from the, from the, the history of emotions and the different concepts. Uh, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on this. That would be great. Okay. So thank you for the question. Um, I do not consider my new book a history of emotions. The difference is, um, I call it an emotional history of fleeing because I was much more interested in the refugees and less interested just in emotions. So I talk a lot about emotions, but I'm talking about everything, practical things, um, daily life. Uh, the fact that there's one person, you know, one person writes my son, can't wear his shoes anymore. Now that's because the sun is growing, they have no money. So they stay in the, in the pension room and they can't go out because he can't walk. Um, that of course has an emotional aspect to it, but it has a very practical aspect too. They have to go to the aid organization and beg for new shoes. So I didn't want, if I did an emotional history, I guess my emotional history would have had to be anxiety you know, getting out, getting out, getting out. And I didn't want to do that because what I saw in the refugees was hope and anxiety. They were very uh, hard at work to get out. They didn't just sit around. I mean, yeah, they sat around, smoked cigarettes and, and, and worried in cafes, but they stood on lines. They wrote petitions. They wrote to everybody and his uncle with their last name in the New York telephone book. I mean, they were doing stuff all the time and they were in hope. So I didn't, I would have had to do anxiety and hope. And I don't know, it felt too reductive to me. I wanted to tell the whole story. So I think that's the difference. When I started reading History of Emotions, which I find fascinating, there's like a book called Fear. And it describes, that's the one I think on the French Revolution. Yeah, that it describes fear. I didn't want to do that. So I think that's the answer. I, I was doing an emotional history, not a uh, fleeing, not, a history of emotions. Um, and I, I learned a lot from that field. And I think it's use, very useful. Um, and maybe some Holocaust scholar will start doing exactly that. But I wouldn't claim that I'm doing it. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm glad of it is. So I think, do we have any more questions from the audience? I think I exhausted them. No, I think, well, if you look at the chat, you'll see that the, that it's the other way around. Um, I think that uh, Alexandra has a question. Yes. If you can unmute yourself. Uh, hello, and thank you so much also for your research, which guides me in every step. I'm researching um, Germ um, Jewish women who stayed in Germany and were active in the cultural life. Uh, so those who wrote uh, poetry and um, literary texts and also worked in the Jewish Kulturbund. Um, and I have a question because you um, pointed out about uh, the fact that women were taking over the roles traditionally um, taken by men. And I have noticed the same um, mechanism when it comes to women who are publishing in Jewish press in Germany until 1938, that with every year, there were more and more texts by women. Um, and uh, it seems to me, maybe I am wrong, that to some extent, this was also exceptional uh, in terms not only of the uh, German Jewish press, but comparing it to other European newspapers in uh, this 
um, Jewish newspapers. Um, I mean, we see many more women writing than, let's say, in Polish Jewish newspapers from the same time period. So to some extent, the fact that um, a lot of Jewish men writers and journalists left, right? Or um, at some point, I mean, many of them left and women had much harder time leaving Germany, which is something you also were pointing out. Um, and that gave women a very unique opportunity to really express what they were going through, through poetry and novels and short stories. So this is more a thank you because because of you, I started researching it um, because I read uh, your book. And uh, then since I'm in literary studies, then I decided to concentrate on literary texts. But of course, you cannot do it without the historical perspective. Uh, but um, uh, do you think that I'm right in seeing it, this development? I think you are right. And I think what's so interesting is that those writers, those famous writers, German, non-Jewish and Jewish who left, they didn't have email. They couldn't write for their audiences anymore. Let's say just talking about um, about life, not talking about fascism. They couldn't write fast enough. They couldn't get it across. The mails were very slow. They would have replaced those women, but they didn't. So those women had more of a chance as the writers left mm -hmm. to fill in spaces. And I think that's absolutely the case. Thank you. And also, I mean, they did have a harder time leaving. They, Right. The statistics are just, you know, women and these younger women also, let's say single women who were writing, who were trying to make a living, didn't want to leave their mothers. There's also that whole section that I talked about where they couldn't leave their mothers. So they didn't leave. Thank you so much. Thank you all for uh, good questions. And really, I think that it was so interesting and so informative. So thank you, Professor Kaplan, for this fascinating talk. And uh, I really, I, I'm, I really hope that you you uh, would be able to join us for the next session. I will just remind you all that we will take a short break uh, of half an hour, so you can refresh, uh, have a coffee, and we will meet again in half an hour for a very, very interesting panel uh, with uh, free, uh, four uh, fascinating scholars. Uh, so I'm really hoping to see all of you here. The, the Zoom is, is, uh, is available. You can just um, uh, like mute yourself and, and shut your camera, or you can log out and log in with the same link, whatever you prefer. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing you all in half an hour. Enjoy the break. And again, Professor Kaplan, thank you so much. It, you're muted. Yeah. Thank you to everybody who attended and see you later. <laughs>